the right future YouTube channel. This is obviously my first episode, the first show we're doing. So what I am going to do in this episode, in this show, is I am going to do two things. One, I'm going to tell you why I am creating this channel. What is the purpose of the channel? And secondly, I am going to discuss my political philosophy in a very generalized way. I want you, the audience, to be able to know exactly what you can expect to hear from me every upload. So first, why am I creating this YouTube channel? Pretty simple. I am a traditional Reagan conservative. It's hard to find places to go to get my viewpoint. There, I can't find video, audio, print that I can go to and say, oh yeah, I agree with that. Oh, I like that. Now, it's not always good to have your viewpoint. And when you go for news, you shouldn't want your viewpoint. You should want the news. But sometimes you want to watch politics, listen to politics, and you want to hear somebody who agrees with you. And I have been looking for that, whether it's, again, podcast, TV, YouTube, print even. And it's just not there. You know, it, the media is owned and operated by the establishment of the Democratic Party. That's just a fact. Whether it's network, NBC, CBS, ABC. Whether it's PBS, which is owned by us, and we still have to deal with that liberal dribble. Um, CNN. We, we, we saw what happened with Jeff, with Jeff Zucker. He was working hand in hand with Andrew Cuomo, the New York governor. A Democrat, working hand in hand with him. This is a news network? Nah. It's just a, another Democrat establishment. We'll, we'll see what the, new, what the new ownership does. David Zasiloff, the head of Warner Brothers Disney, or Warner Brothers Discovery, excuse me. And what Chris Lick does, the new president of CNN. We'll see. The rumors are he's trying to get it back to hard news. There's been, and the rumors also have been, there's been pushback inside the building, which of course there is because they want to be able to spew their liberal nonsense all the time. But we'll see. Obviously, MSN, DNC, we're not, you're not going to get honest news. But those places that you just get liberal talking points, you don't get the news. So that's not what is offered. So if you're going to listen to one of those, you're going to hear liberal trouble. Fox News has largely been taken over by Trump loyalists now. Maybe since the midterm losses, which we will discuss in the future, maybe that is starting to change. Maybe we are starting to see a move away from Trump to something else. Even if it's DeSantis, who isn't my favorite, I don't have anything against DeSantis, I'd probably vote for him. But not my perfect cup of tea, I would prefer others, but I I would take him, I would gladly vote for him, I would... In a primary, in a general, I'd be quite pleased with him as the nominee. Maybe they'll go there. And it looks like maybe Fox News is heading there with the Murdochs just being sick of Trump. Fox, or the Wall Street Journal seems to be going there. The New York Post is going heavy on DeSantis. So we'll see if they're shifting. But we haven't had that for a while. And obviously print, I mean, the New York Times, the Washington Post, what? I mean, Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos. He's a huge Democrat, a huge liberal. Well, a, I guess a mainstream liberal. He's, I wouldn't, he's definitely not a progressive. And the New York Times, the, it's the DNC's go-to. So obviously we're not able to go there. If you go on the YouTube a lot of what you're going to get is progressive content, far left liberal content. And that's fine. That's what millennials my age tend to go for. I, I'm not one of them. I don't want that. So <clears throat> there's not much on YouTube. And if in a lot of the podcast space, again, is fairly liberal philosophy or like the war room you're going to get with Steve Bannon, a lot of Trump, big lie, 
garbage. And that's what the 2020 lie is, that the election was stolen. It's garbage. So there's not a lot of places to go. And I think I can be a small part in helping rebuild this community. My viewpoint, the more Reagan, conservative, traditional viewpoint, was the common viewpoint on June 5th, June 15th, 2015. That was the day before Trump announced for president. Now, it, it changed in a hurry. And I think one of the reasons that happened is Marco Rubio on a debate stage in New Hampshire. And again, I, this isn't the time and place to talk about that. I'm trying to introduce myself. But I will discuss that in the future. But I want to be a, a small building block in restoring this voice. I want to be able to help bring back the the electoral brains of the Republican Party in in Alabama one you want to put up a really hardcore conservative fine a strict conservative who isn't willing to bend fine that's fine you you, you can't do that in Washington's third congressional district where you put up a we put up a nut job Joe Kent who by the way economically is closer to Bernie Sanders than the center of the Republican Party now even with Trump but he's socially very right wing we kind of know what that means narrow Trump but we are I, I do believe there is a large constituency constituency out there for viewpoints like mine for viewpoints of a more Reagan conservative and if I can be just a tiny small building block in that I want to do so an important thing to remember for anybody listening who's thinking oh no Trump is the way to go you can't win policy goals policy victories unless you win elections we had a 2020 election that again i will discuss in a future future show that was a easy win for us republic joe biden the president of the united states 42 percent approval but we went with trump and trump's people won a lot of these primaries and the only reason Trump endorsed was if you said the 2020 election was stolen, you lied that the 2020 election was stolen. So we lost all these races. And now we only have a four-person majority in the House. And we lost the seat in the Senate. Again, largely because of who Trump picked for both governor, which has a big impact as those are on the top of ballots in midterms, and for Senate, as well as the House, as I just mentioned. So if you want to win those policy debates, you got to win elections. And we're not doing so right now with this failed strategy put forward by Trump and a lot of his people. And we see now, and we've seen this, and this isn't Trump for the most part. Like Trump demands loyalty at all points. He doesn't care about policy victories he cares about personal accolades but we've seen a lot of of republicans and since the tea party movement started in 2010 and really got swept people in the office in 2011 we've seen a lot of this term rhino thrown around and it's if you don't agree with the most far right economic or social aspects of the Republican Party, social philosophy of the Republican Party, you're a rhino, you're not a real Republican. There's a famous quote from President Reagan. The person who votes with you 80% of the time is a friend and an ally, not a 20% traitor. Somebody like Susan Collins is quite often called a rhino. She represents the state of Maine. She votes with Republicans about 60% of the time. It's a Democrat state. That's the best you're going to get there. It's the best you're going to get. People talk about Lisa Murkowski in Alaska. Well, guess what? They just elected a Democrat 
to represent them in the House of Representatives. Why? Because we put Sarah Palin up there. So Alaska isn't a Trumpy state. We're not going to be successful in Alaska if we continue to run people like Donald Trump and his acolytes. It's not going to work. So, yes, Lisa Murkowski is better than what Trump put up there. And this is coming from a person who supported Joe Miller in 2010. And I would have supported Kelly Toshiba in this election if her entire reason for running was to back Trump because Murkowski voted to him to remove. Whether you agree with that or not, that's not a reason to run for the United States Senate. So I couldn't support her. I'm not a Murkowski guy, but I would have voted for her and supported her in this year because you got to be for more than, hey, I'm for Trump. What's your policy goal? What do you care about besides Trump? Because that's not a reason to vote. Remember, this country is about laws. It's about the idea of America, not about people. And with Trump and with his predecessor, Barack Obama, it was much about the person, not the values of the country and what the country stands for, which is laws, the Constitution, what we stand for. So now the second part of the video, my political philosophy. So you know what you're going to get from a philosophical standpoint. I'm a conservative. We may not always agree on social issues, but economically, we're going to agree. On social issues, I'm 34 years old. I'm a millennial. While I don't agree with a lot of millennials, I, I'm, I'm brought up in a different social atmosphere. So we're not always going to agree. But on economic issues, I'm as conservative as it gets. Intelligent. Understand how things need to happen in order to get, like I said, policy goals advanced. Strategic. But harshly conservative. Harshly conservative. I'm for lower taxes. I'm also for a progressive tax code. But I'm for lower taxes. People should be able to hurt, keep more of their hard-earned money. It's a fact. We also know this tax the rich stuff is just class warfare. The top 10% pay 90% of the taxes. That is not some tax system where the rich get away with stuff. 10% pay 90% of the taxes. That's a lot. I'm for smaller government. The government's too big. It's too bloated. It's too centralized in the executive branch. The presidency has too much power. The federal government has too much power. But largely, the executive branch. I am for federalism. I am for the separation of powers, checks and balances. We're supposed to have three equal, equal branches of government at the federal level. We don't. We have a powerful, we have a tiered system. The most powerful, the executive branch. Second most powerful, judiciary, which is unelected. And the third most powerful, legislative. If one of them was going to be more, the founders would have rather had the legislative branch be the most powerful. But it's by far the weakest because they've given away power, and I am not for that. That's one thing. So, but I'm for smaller government, like, as I said. And one thing I really believe from a strategic standpoint that conservatives should do is take a note from what Democrats and specifically progressives have done. Let's, let's stop using the phrase smaller government. Some people, a lot of people now have a negative connotation of it. Let's use a different word than smaller. How about efficient? The government is so big, it's not efficient. 
most people, especially suburban voters, that we desperately need to get back to winning elections will totally agree with that. The government's so big, it's inefficient. It's so big, there is so much du- duplicative programs and departments doing the same thing, and it's just overhead upon overhead upon overhead. We can and should do better with Americans' tax dollars. A fishing government. Again, progressives did this with Medicare for All. They used to call it single-payer health care. Single-payer health care wasn't popular. But one program of the federal government that is popular, besides the military, is Medicare. By the way, it's most popular with people who don't need to use it. Most, most people need to use it, don't love it so much. That most people on Medicare who actually like Medicare, the most popular program in Medicare is Medicare Part D, which has Medicare, and then you can get supplemental private insurance. So still getting private insurance. Single payer, Medicare for all, I'm going to ban all private insurance. Get rid of it. That is not popular. But they, but these progressives found a phrase, a term that really resonated with a group of people. So they stopped calling it single payer and started calling it Medicare for all. It's the same exact thing. They didn't change anything. It's still the government owns and operates insurance. The simple. It's the same thing. But they chose something that was more popular, that would catch on with more Americans, and they stuck with it, and they beat it home. And now, Medicare for All is more popular than ever. How about we take that page? We say, efficient government. Again, a lot of these small business owners who live in suburban areas, families, successful families, will understand that the government's inefficient. And in order to make it more efficient, we have to trim. People will understand this. I'm pro-free trade. Very much so. Trade has been good for the country. Everything has winners and losers. Everything. No matter what. You're not, you very, very rarely get a, a anything, a system, anything that gets a win-win. Trades in sports, often somebody loses. Sometimes you get a good trade where one team gets what they need, the other team gets what they need, and they both rise up, but it's unusual. In, in whether it's any economic system, capitalism, socialism, whatever it is, you have winners and losers. And in trade, that's no different. Unfortunately, I'm from, I, la, I live in North Carolina. I am a refugee fleeing economic depression in Syracuse, New York. That's where I'm from, Syracuse. It's it's bad. Boarded up buildings. You go to the Triangle in North Carolina. it's It's hard to go to a corner where they're not building something. In New York... Upstate New York, outside of New York City, it's hard to go places where they're not, where they're building. It's hard to find new builds. It's, it's a different place. And part of the reason is it was actually upstate New York, Syracuse, Fulton, Oswego, Watertown, big manufacturing area. Free trade has hurt manufacturing. I argue that a lot of that is in a unfair tax code, not the trade deals, but some of it's been trade deals. But what we've gotten in return, and that's not just my hometown, my home area of Syracuse where I'm from. It's, you know, as we know, it's the Rust Belt, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana. They have been hurt by it. 
But the entire country benefits from lower prices. The entire country, including Wisconsin, including Michigan, including Pennsylvania, including my home area of Syracuse, New York. Including my current area in the Triangle in North Carolina. Everybody benefits from lower, from lower prices, especially the lower and working class. People who most likely are to oppose free trade. It's good for them. There is an exception. One, the USMCA. Two exceptions. USMCA had got rid of NAFTA. It's far worse than NAFTA. Far worse than NAFTA. And again, we can get in, we'll get into this stuff more. And the other is PNTR. Permanent National Trade Relations. And that's the trade deal, big trade deal with China that Bill Clinton negotiated. It's been an utter failure. No question about it. Hindsight, no question about it. So, but pro-free trade, pro-capital, pro-capitalism, excuse me. Pro-free markets. Capitalism has lifted more people out of poverty in America than anywhere else in the world. It's the best system invented my parents have always struggled i am much better off economically than they are that's thanks to america and one thing that is often misconstrued with what being pro free markets means is pro big business I'm not, I, I'm not against big business. Big business is necessary. But I'm anti-monopoly. You cannot be for monopolies and be pro-free markets. They are not compatible. Free markets? Monopoly is the antithesis. Monopolies close markets. So if we want free markets, we got to be against monopolies. And that is one area where the government has an obligation to regulate on behalf of the American consumer. And another part of my political philosophy, pro very strong national defense, peace through strength, coined by the great Ronald Reagan. You're going to hear me use that name quite a lot going forward. And that means a strong military. And key that we've lost is being for advancing America's interest overseas. In areas like, yes, Ukraine. We want Russia to lose. They're our enemy. And finally, a big one. Immigration. I'm against illegal immigration. Pretty simple. I think illegal immigration is bad. You cannot have a nation without borders. You need, we need strong borders. That is true. Whether you believe a wall will work... We're going to find out in the future if you think I believe a wall will work. I'm guessing you're going to tell by this. I think it works in some areas, not in others. We need borders. We need to have a strong border. We need to know who's coming in and out. It's a national security threat. That's 100% true. Since Donald Trump entered the race and has kind of captured the Republican Party, we have been against legal immigration. There was a bill during the their Trump years pushed by now fired Senator David Perdue from Georgia to curtail, to limit legal immigration, both family and merit, both white collar and blue collar. And that hurts who? You, that hurts farmers, makes prices higher. That hurts businesses being able to get the talent that they need from places like Asia. It is key to remember that in the 80s and in, in, in 80, 84, 88, even 92, 
the Asian American community was a big Republican voting bloc. It, if it was a big Republican voting bloc now, even a decent-sized voting bloc for Republicans now, Republicans would be in much better shape, especially in Orange County, California, in Southern California. We'd be in a much better position. But demonizing legal immigration has really hurt the, the party. We need to stop that. Immigrants are the core of America. Almost everybody watching this video and anybody who watches my future video are here because of immigration. We need more immigration, not less. We need more ideas, not less. We need more multiculturalism, not less. Reagan's final speech as president. I told you, get ready. It's coming a lot. Immigrants are one of the most important sources of America's greatness. That's what he said in his final speech. It was essentially a love letter to immigrants. And that is totally in line with the shining city on the hill, with a positive, optimistic view of America and view of the future. We want to win elections going forward. We cannot be negative and pessimistic. We have to be optimistic. We have to be hopeful. We have to provide a positive vision of the future. If you want to win elections, if you want to stop Democrats, that's what you need to do. Those are my political viewpoints. I will be expanding on them in the future. I will be talking about, obviously, current events and my views and my political philosophy will always be intertwined in those. And you will get this style in my videos. I am excited about this opportunity. Coming forward, as I get in a little more of a groove, I will have a regular schedule and I will keep you all up to date on that schedule. But for now, thank you all for watching and listening. I'll catch you on the next one.